Fine. Don't worry about it. Is it recording? Is it quiet? Yeah. All right. Let's get started. Father, thanks for this night and for the people that you brought. Thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to uh, internalize the truth of what you revealed last time, that we are your workmanship, that we are your masterpiece of all the things you've made. You uh, you say of us that we are, we're the, we're it, we're the crowning achievement, we're, we're the thing that brings you joy. In. And uh, I pray that we would see ourselves through your life and know that that's not us, that's you. You've made us that way. Father, now as we look into what to do about that, I pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts, that you would motivate us to live rightly in light of who you've made us to be. I pray that you would speak, uh, speak through me, speak through your word, uh, and change lives. I pray. Amen. All right, so um, last week, I think most of you were here, last week we did Ephesians 2.10, the first part, part one. And um, tonight we're going to be continuing. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, in the English Standard Version, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. And we, we emphasized each one of those words and looked at what each of those words means when you, when you stress that word um, and when you look at some comparisons in Scripture for that. So um, we cooperatively are his workmanship, not any one individual person. God's building a church not a person, and so we are his workmanship when we together function as the body of Christ. Um, we are his workmanship, it's not, it's not us, it's not that we're doing this for ourselves and we're trying to make ourselves everything that God wants us to be, um, God is doing this, we're his workmanship. Uh, we talked about the fact that we're created in Christ Jesus, that, that uh, God has done everything, that the thing created has nothing to do about what it's created to be. It's the creator that does it. So um, God is doing this in your life. He is speaking into you and in your life what he wants you to be and what he has desired for you to be. Um, and that Jesus is the central feature of that. So we're going to continue that the sentence starting with four good works. And we're going to look at that phrase. It's interesting, in, in the Greek, um, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Four good works all flows together um, in, in one phrase, and it does in the ESV here too. But they're both talking about the creation. You're created in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the one doing the creating. And you're created for good works. So you are, you are not saved by your good works, as some people will wrongly teach, but you are saved for good works. The reason God saved you is so that you would do something, right? He didn't save you so that you would just be you and saved. He saved you for good works. So you're not saved by your works, but you are saved for works, right? Um, and so you are not made to be a work of art that just sits on a shelf. Think of yourself not as a work of art, but more as a tool, right? I brought a shovel. So... Shovels can do things. Shovels can do things. Shovels can dig holes. Um, I suppose if you have a, uh, a, a dead body, you can help take care of it this way, right? Um, and that could be a dead gerbil, right? Your favorite pet, a little cemetery in the back. You can bury things. You can, uh, you can dig uh, irrigation trenches. You can dig trenches to bring water from a river out to a field, and you can have a crop that's healthier because you dug a ditch. My uncle just got back from Africa where he spent a week digging a ditch. 
he dug a ditch from a, a well that was uh, one and a half miles away from the village. And he, he dug a ditch from the well to the village. He dug a mile and a half long ditch. It took him a couple weeks. And then they were able to lay a pipe in the ditch and, uh, and bring water to the village. And it was an amazing gift to people who lived there. Shovels can do things. But if you are God's shovel, and all you do is sit on the rack, a nice little shovel, right? Just sitting there, being a shovel, and you are never in the hand of God doing something, why own a shovel? Why own a shovel if it never digs a hole? Why own a shovel if it never digs a ditch? Why own a shovel if it doesn't shape some hill? Why own a shovel if it just sits there? And I think a lot of Christians are like shovels on a rack, and God's like, yeah, I've got that shovel. wish it did something. I wish that shovel would do something. I designed it for a purpose. It's not a piece of art. It's a, it's a tool. I want to use that shovel for something, and it just sits on the shelf being a shovel. That doesn't make much sense. Similarly, my grandfather, on his 70th birthday, our whole family pitched together and bought him a Cadillac. He knew my grandfather's story. It's an amazing life story. Someday his story should be a book or a movie. His life was incredible. But he was a, uh, a very poor guy, and his whole life, he, never, he, he was never wealthy. Um, and so on his 70th birthday, all of his kids and grandkids and everybody descended from him, all like 25 of us, pitched together, and we bought my grandfather a Cadillac for his 70th birthday. And he was... Lord, you see the video of him receiving it, and he's just, he's beside himself that he owns a Cadillac. But he was so uncomfortable in it, because he'd always driven like 20-year-old pickup trucks, right? That driving around in a Cadillac just made him uncomfortable. He always thought somebody was going to mug him for his Cadillac. And so he left it parked in his garage under a cover, and he never drove it. Because he was afraid somebody would kill him for his Cadillac. When he died, eight years later, the Cadillac had 2,500 miles on it. In eight years, he put on 2,500 miles. Let me tell you, if somebody bought me a new Cadillac, the miles would be spinning on that thing, right? Because they're cool to drive. So, but he drove 2,500 miles in eight years. Because he was terrified of using it. And that's, my grandfather owning that Cadillac is kind of like God having saved some of you. And it's not the Cadillac's fault in the case of my grandfather. My grandfather never wanted to use it, so the analogy kind of breaks down a little bit. God wants to use you, but are you being used? Are you working? Or are you just being saved? And one day you will not go to hell, and that's about all we can say about your Christian life. Right? That's not why God saved you. God didn't save you to be a work of art on the wall. He saved you for good works. And I think we as Christians get kind of messed up when we, we get so excited about the fact that we're saved by grace and we're saved by faith and it's not of works. And, and Paul just said that in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, right? You're saved by grace, not by works, so that it's not of yourselves and you can't boast about it. You're not saved by works, but you are saved for works. So if you're not working, what's up? Why are you not working? I think Christians get messed up when they don't do anything about their faith. God made you to do something. And if you're sitting there, not only is it not any good for the kingdom of God that you're sitting there, but it's also not any good for you. It is so fulfilling as a Christian to be doing something for the work of the gospel. And if you don't do something, I think oftentimes that's when your faith gets weak and you start to lose your faith and you start to wonder, is this all real? Is Jesus for real? Or is this just a story my parents told me like Santa? Because if you're not doing anything, you don't experience it. Kind of like a border collie. Anybody ever owned a border collie? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody owns a border collie. Okay. Border collies are a dog. They're a, she they're a shepherd dog. They're meant to herd sheep. And if you are a cattle owner, a border, border collie is the best dog you've ever owned. It'll steer cows. It'll steer sheep. It'll even steer chickens. They are amazing herding animals. But if you don't give them a job, they want to herd things. And you don't 
have some creature for them to hurt, they start hurting your children. Uh, literally, they do. They'll get behind babies and like nip them in the butt, and, like, no, I want you to go that way. Um, and that's why people are like, border cartons are terrible pets. Well, they're just not made to live inside with your child. They're meant to like herd sheep. Um, I, you know, I, I used to live on a ranch, and we had a border called Mix, and the dog was great at protecting creatures. Um, but then, you know, it, if that same dog were to live in a house, it would start to, it would start to go crazy. If people who own border collies and apartments. They wind up having their furniture destroyed and their life taken over by a dog that's just insane because the dog was not meant to live in the space with people. It was meant to be out there on the range with creatures. Kind of like a Christian that was meant to do something for the kingdom and just sit there. Not what God meant you to do. You go kind of a little bit crazy and your faith starts to fall apart because you're not doing what he meant for you to do. So you are saved by grace through faith for good works. Okay? Look with me at James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. Somebody want to read that? Mr. Caleb. Thank you. For Alec. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Caleb. <laughs> James 2, 14 through 26. For you sit to sit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith like he has no words, and that faith save him. Through 26. If your brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm to be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary to their body, what use is that? If it has no works, it's dead in by itself. The song may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by works. You believe that God is one, you do well, and the demons also believe and shun. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father, our father justified by works? when he suffered of Isaac, his son, on the offspring. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God, to see that man is justified by works, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out, I'll buy another way. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Okay. Did anybody else's eyebrows raise? In verse 24, you see a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. See, in Ephesians 2.9, it says, you've been saved by, by, through grace by faith, and this is not of yourself, not of works. Paul says you're not saved by works, you're saved by faith. And then James says you're justified by works, not by faith alone. Anybody else see a conflict there? Mm -hmm. At first, you're like, wait a minute, James and Paul should get together over a cup of coffee and figure out who's right. And then they should write us a letter and say, just kidding, one of us was wrong. Because James is saying you're saved by your works, and Paul is saying you're saved by faith. And Paul says it's not by works. And James says it's not by faith alone. So at first you look at this and you're like, okay, we have a conflict. The problem is, Paul held one pen and wrote one letter. James held another pen and wrote another letter. But we understand that the Holy Spirit worked through both men to write both letters. So the Holy Spirit won't contradict himself. So somewhere there is an answer to this question. Um, but let's dwell on what James says first before we try to dismiss it too quickly. James says, your faith, by itself, without works, is dead. What do you think he means by that? <coughs> what do you think he means by that? Your faith by itself, without works, is dead. Okay, so you're saying that the causation is not that you have faith, which dies, but that you 
say you have faith, but it's not true because your life is not showing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good answer. It's a very good answer. What else? What, what else? It's like a plant that doesn't bear fruit, then is it really worth anything? Right. Yeah. My parents used to have a fruitless plum tree, and they bought it with the tag that said fruitless plum. And they're like, oh, cool, that won't get our yard dirty with plums. Like, what the heck? <laughs> Why find a fruitless plum tree? So we can have a plum tree that doesn't make plums. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. But yes, yeah, same idea. Um, it doesn't do anything. Funny little story. Uh, uh, it's obviously not a true story, right? Did you hear the story of the girl who kissed a frog and believed that it had turned into a prince? Mm -hmm. yeah. The next day she took the frog to the school. Her friends all asked, hey, what's with your frog? Not a frog, she said, it's a prince. They all said, um, no, it's a frog. And the whole time the frog is saying, croak, croak, croak. Didn't matter how much she believed that the frog was a prince. Everybody else around her knew it was a frog, right? And they also thought, she's crazy. And that's the same thing that happens when we walk around and say to everybody, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, but everybody looks at your life and says, uh, no, no, you don't believe. And it's nice that you think you believe, and it's nice that you talk about the fact that you believe, but I look at your life and I see you don't believe. James would say that your faith is dead. You talk faith, but you don't do faith, and your faith is just as much alive as a dead body without its spirit. Let's go to another perspective on the same issue. Go to Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 30. Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 30. Somebody else with a good reading voice. Thank you, Alex. Romans 3, 19 through 30. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may be accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for all those who believe, for there is no <coughs> distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and a justifier of the one who was, has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Um, since indeed God will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith is one. So Ephesians says you're saved by grace, through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, so no one can boast. James says you're saved by works, not by faith alone. And then Paul comes back to the argument and says, no, 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 no. Verse 28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works. Okay, now we're getting really confused. Are these guys being filled by the same Holy Spirit? Yes. Are they being inspired by the same Holy Spirit to write the Word of God? Yes. Will the Holy Spirit argue with himself? No. So somehow we have to hold in one hand that faith is what saves you. And we have to hold in the other hand that works really matter. And if you don't have works, you aren't saved. Let me say that again. If you don't have works, you aren't saved. But if you are saved, it's not because of the works. Am I confusing you? I hope I'm not confusing you. If you go back to our home verse, Ephesians 2... Let's read it very carefully again, and let's, let's hopefully put this all together. <coughs> Ephesians 2, 
Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. Actually, yes, verse 8. Let's we'll start there. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So you're saved by God's grace through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works. So no one can boast. And I think verse 10 answers this question very well. We are his workmanship. God did it all. Created in Christ Jesus. God did it through Jesus. For good works. Now you ask yourself the question, why did God save you? One answer is for his own glory and pleasure. But according to this verse, why did God save you? So you would do something, right? Does God make a mistake? Oh, no. So will God save you for a purpose that you aren't doing? No. So if you're not doing anything about your faith, did God save you? No. No. Did, I hope that terrifies some of you. Because it's appropriate to be terrified when you read that verse. It's appropriate to be terrified. The Bible says it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. God loves you. And God wants you saved. There's lots of verses about that. But the only way we can look at our lives and say, am I saved, is not because you talk. We can look at our lives and see, am I saved because of how you walk, because of what you do. So if you tell people, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, and then you go home and in the quietness of your privacy, you get on your phone and you look at porn, you got problems. If you tell people, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, and then you don't love people, you backbite, you trash talk, you gossip, you've got problems. If God has given you resources of strength and ability in your body and you never serve somebody, got problems. God saved you for good works. The works do not save you, but they are the evidence that you have been saved. Okay? Not quite as field a message as it was last week. But I want you to I want you to think about this, right? If you look at Hebrews 11, let's go one other place. Hebrews 11. I'm sure you have read Hebrews 11 many, many, many times. Hebrews 11 is sometimes called the Hall of Faith. Sports clubs have the Hall of Fame. The Bible has the Hall of Faith. And it talks about all these people who believed God. But I want you to read chapter 11, or hear me read chapter 11 to you with a different eye. I want you to notice that it never says that somebody believed and did nothing. As a matter of fact, every time in chapter 11 of Hebrews it says by faith, the word faith shows up, the very next thing, the very next phrase is a verbal phrase about what somebody did because of their faith. Notice that as we read it, okay? Chapter 11 of Hebrews, for faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. By it the men of old, of the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which were visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up, so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up. For he obtained the witness that before his brother, that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about the things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, 
when he was called, obeyed by going to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for a city which has its foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Even as Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, that as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. Those who say such things make it, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would not have uh, had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and whom he had received the promises and was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise up people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a title. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding the things to come. By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel, and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's evil. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of a king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell, after they had been in, encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish, along with those who were disobedient, after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises and shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of the fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from the weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sewn into, they were temp uh, tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they would not be made. An amazing chapter. Every time it says, by faith, the next thing is because they did something. Nowhere, 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 in Hebrews 11 doesn't say, by faith, they sat on their butt. You don't find that in Scripture. You don't find that in Scripture. By faith, they were quiet and didn't tell anybody that they believed. Nope. By faith, they did. By faith, they acted. Saving faith is not sitting faith. Saving faith cannot sit. So, there is a phrase that says saving faith is working faith. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Faith that is strong enough to save you is faith that will get you moving. Faith that will make you do something about the fact that you are saved. Um, look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. 
Titus chapter 3. Uh, this is Paul writing to an apprentice pastor under his care. It says, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable. So, again, we're justified by grace, not because of what we do. We can't be good enough to earn salvation. God gives us salvation as a gift. But after he has given it to us, you are to be urged into good deeds. Do something about your faith. Martin Luther, hopefully you all know who that is. Martin Luther is the guy who started the Protestant movement. He's the reason that we are not Catholics. Okay? Martin Luther started the Protestant movement, um, and he was looking at this problem of, you know, I'm saved by faith, but I'm evaluated on my works. How does this work? And Martin Luther said this. This is a quote from him. It's very good. It says, The question is asked, how can justification take place without the works of the law, even though James says faith without works is dead? The answer from the apostle distinguishes between the law and faith, the letter and grace. The works of the law are works done without faith and grace by the law, which forces them to be done through fear or enticing promises of temporal advantage. But the works of faith are those done in the spirit of liberty, purely out of a love for God. And they can be done by those who are justified by faith. An ape can cleverly imitate the actions of a man, but he is not therefore a man. Let me read that again. An ape can cleverly imitate the actions of a man, but he is not therefore a man. If he were to become a man, it would undoubtedly be by virtue of the works of uh, you would not be by virtue of the works which he imitated, but by virtue of something else, namely by an act of God. Then having been made a man, he would perform the works of men in proper fashion. Paul does not say that faith is without its characteristic works, but that it justifies without the works of the law. Therefore, justification does not require the works of the law, but it does require a living faith, which will require that one perform its works. I think it's a beautiful statement. You could train an ape to act like a person, and that doesn't mean that he's a person. Just like somebody could live a moral life and try to prove that they're a Christian, but they're not a Christian. But once that ape has been made a man, that ape will act like a man, because he is a man. Once you've been made a Christian, you should act like a Christian, because you are a Christian. Right? A saving faith is an acting faith. And then, at this point, you might be kind of stressed out and be like, ah, what should I do? God, okay, you saved me, and I'm not doing much about my faith. And I, I realize that's wrong, that's dangerous, I don't, I want to be different. Okay, what should I do? And now you get all stressed out about what should I do. Well, I'm 15, I can't go to Africa as a missionary. <laughs> um, I don't really have a job, I can't give money to those who go to Africa as missionaries. Um, I go to school all day, I can't go volunteer in the soup kitchen. Um, Jesus, I... I'm saved, what am I going to do? Jesus has that worked out. He's fixed that problem for you, right? Back in our home verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. You, for we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, and what's the next phrase? Which God has prepared in advance that we should walk in them. Oh, hallelujah. God has saved you for a purpose. He has saved you to do good works. But he doesn't just look at you and go, shovel. You're a shovel. You should do something about that. Why aren't you doing something about that shovel? No. He has prepared good works for you to do. God has laid out your life plan. And we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the fact that you're his workmanship. That you're not an accident. Okay? You are purposefully his workmanship. And he made you to do something. And he's not leaving the doing something up to you. He's prepared in advance what you should do. God wired me to be a teacher. He built me to be a teacher. I am so excited about being a teacher. And when I tried to do other things for a couple of years, it was just not, mm -mm, it's not what God meant for me to do. But God made me a teacher. And he put this before me. And I'm doing what he's asked me to do, and it gives me great joy. God's made you to do something. And he has put your life in such a way that you, his workmanship, will do what he has called and prepared for you to do. You don't have to turn there because I'm running, I'm running out of time. But Psalm 139 says that God knows your inward parts, that he knit you together in your mother's womb. And then it says this amazing thing, that all the days ordained for you were written in his book before one came to be. How big is God? All the days ordained for you were written in his book before one came to be. So you're sitting there stressing out about, okay, God, I want to do something for you. What in the world can I do for you? God knew that you would come to this day when you would realize you need to get off your butt and do something about your faith. He knew that. He ordained for you to be here. This was written in his book for you before you were conceived. And he knows what he has for you. He knows the next step. It's written in his book for you too. What you need to do is ask for God to let you read his book. What is it, Lord, that you have prepared for me in advance that I should walk in? That's the task, right? God, I'm your tool. I was made, if I'm a shovel, I was made to dig a ditch. I was made to bury something. I was made to shape a hill. God, show me your ditch. And I want to dig, right? Show me what it is that you've made me to do, and I want to do it. That's what a saved person feels. That's what a saved person does. Uh, God has something for you to do. And you will know his joy, and you will know the incredible satisfaction of doing what God has asked you to do when you're doing it. Uh, just an illustration of that. Uh, World War II breaks out, and uh, Australia, obviously a part of the crown, part of the United Kingdom, um, Australia wants to help Great Britain in the war effort, and Australia asks, what can we do for you in the war effort? And Great Britain says, build us ships. We don't have enough ships. The Australians didn't have a shipyard to crank out warships, and they said, by the time we build a shipyard and we start producing ships, the war's going to be over. We're not going to build you ships. Uh, we've got a lot of farmland, though. We'll make you bread. So they grew a bunch of wheat. And they tried to ship all this wheat to Great Britain to feed the soldiers. The problem is there were no ships to bring the wheat to Great Britain. And all of the wheat piled up on the docks. And it got infected with disease and funguses and rodents. And people that lived around the docks actually died because of the diseases that were growing in piles of wheat. And Great Britain never got a single ship from Australia, and they didn't get much wheat from them either because there were no ships to pick it up. Great Britain had asked Australia to do something. Australia had thought they had a better plan, and they wound up suffering because of it. The same thing happens for us. God has ordained something for you to do. 
He has made you his workmanship, and he has ordained something for you to walk in. Your job, as the workmanship of God, is to find that thing and do it. And let me tell you, you will find such joy in that. You will find such joy in the will of God. Um, so there's other verses that can go along with this, but I think you understand what I'm talking about. When you, when you come to this point in your life um, where you want to be used by the Lord, and I hope that you're there, it's not that he needs you to go start something new either, right? Realistically, you're 12 to 17 years old. Um, you're not going to probably, at this point in your life, go start some new work. But you know who you are. You know how God has wired you. You know what he has put in your heart to bring you joy. Are you a bubbly people person? Do you like chatting it up with people? Then go find somewhere you can talk to people about Jesus. Are you like not that way, you're the introvert who wants to sit in a room by themselves, that's fine. Find some ministry you can file things for. You know, whatever it is, however God has wired you. Are you athletic? Find some way to encourage athletes in the name of Christ. Are you artistic? Find some way to produce art for the ministry of the church. Redo their logo, redo their signage. Do something with what God has given you. Start the habit of your life of being used by Him and not being a brand new, clean, shiny tool that has never been used. Don't be my grandfather's Cadillac that in eight years drove 2,500 miles. Be a Christian. Get dirty. Get used. Get beat up. Sometimes it's hurtful when you are in the ministry and people do mean things to you. But you know what? This shovel's been used. How do you know? Well, rusty. it's rusty and it's all scratched up. <laughs> and people are like, I don't want to be in the ministry, it's hard, and people are mean to me. Yeah, that's how you know a tool's been used. It's not pretty. And sometimes the ministry is that way too, so don't be afraid of that. A tool that has done its job is not necessarily pretty to look at. But it's done its job. And may that be true. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, Kind of a strong word tonight. I didn't necessarily mean for it to come out that strong, but but I believe you did. Holy Spirit, you have you have regenerated our hearts. You have saved us from hell. God, on behalf of these young ones in the room, I I ask for your forgiveness for times when we sit there as saved people and do nothing. I hope that tonight brought some fear because that's appropriate if our lives don't bear fruit. Holy Spirit, I pray that right now you be convicting hearts. I pray that you would be opening people's eyes to the truth of where they stand with you right now. And I pray that you would save Lord Jesus. And that you would save us by faith for good works, that after this point, this night would be a line in the sand where there's a difference in lives, not just a difference in faith, not just that we believe the right things, but that we're about the right things, not that we confess and do nothing, but that people look at us and say, you're a Christian, aren't you? We don't have to tell them. God can make hearts draw them. Right now, with everybody's eyes closed, I, I really feel like God's calling uh, us to a point of repentance. And I don't know where you are with Jesus. I don't know many of you personally. But you know you. And more importantly, the Holy Spirit knows you. God knows you. God loves you. God wants you to be about his kingdom. So perhaps there are some of you who... Uh, who have been talking like you're saved, but have not been living like you're saved. And tonight, you want to take care of that. You want to say, no, um, it's different now. And 
you purpose to allow the Holy Spirit to save you on two good works, that your life actions will be different. Or maybe there's a couple of you who, who have never even made the profession before. You haven't had the point in, the, in your life where you have said, I need to be saved. For either of you, someone who is getting saved or somebody who is wanting their life to look like it, right? I want to lead you in a prayer. And, uh, and I want this to be the difference in your life. So if you're in either of those situations, just pray along with me. Dear Jesus, I am Thank you for declaring me your workmanship. I don't want it. I want to live this life. Change me. Make me new in you. And may I serve you. everybody's eyes still closed, no one looking around. Is there anybody who prayed that, either for the first time or the rededication of yourself? There you go. God, it's a good thing to see people turn to you. Thank you so much, Jesus, for saving for saving us for a purpose. God, fill these people with the power of your Holy Spirit. Show them what you have ordained for their life. Show them what you've called them to. And may they find their joy in walking in your plan. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you that raised your hand, thank you so much for your courage. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that's awesome. If you want to talk to Pastor Gary and Bill Keller, that's great to see you.